Okay, so we are good to go now. Here's a game plan. We are going to work on equity valuation. Now we're going to get uh, much more practical. And I think by the end of today's class, all of you uh, guys will have some idea on, you know, how to look at stocks, how to look at valuation. And maybe if things go well, you would also be able to perform some back of the envelope calculations, right? So you might not be able to perform a valuation with precision, but one you would have a reasonable idea in terms of how do you want to get through the valuation. Let me give the heading and let me get started with some of the valuation processes. So equity valuation is what we want to learn. We don't want to learn it, you know, for the exams. We're not learning it to learn the theory. We're learning it so that we can apply it in practice. That's the approach that I'm going to follow. So in general, from valuation perspective, whenever you decide that you want to value a stock, then there are three major approaches or options that you have in terms of how do you do the valuation. So there are one of the three choices that you can use and determine how the valuation is going to work. So first category of valuation, which is generally the most practical uh, is called and very useful and probably the least complicated. We call this as the relative valuation. Relative valuation. The second category of valuation is discounted cash flows, discounted cash flows. And the third category of valuation is generally a more conservative valuation approach. This category most of the time will give you a valuation estimate that's, that's a little low compared to the other methods. And this method of valuation is referred to as an asset based valuation. Okay, so relative valuation, uh, discounted cash flow and asset best valuation. Now we would we would start with the relative valuation first. We will do a few examples and then you would understand where I'm taking you with this. Now this term sounds very fancy to you. On the face of it, it looks like something that you know that's going to be a little technical or it's fancy. It's actually going to be a very easy concept to deal with. And maybe all of us at some stage in our lives, we have used relative valuation. So my favorite example here is, uh, let, let's do a poll. How many candidates who are participating in the session today uh, have, have, have an MBA degree with them? Or how many of them are MBA grads here? Uh, if you can just raise your hands or say me in the chat box. Yeah, so I think we have about at least 20 people who are uh, MBAs. Now, typically what I want you to think, and now this might be a little India specific, but in India, we, we have this thing called campus placement. Are you aware of it? So what, what happens in a campus placement is that uh, uh, the entire batch is kind of getting uh, job offers from different recruiters. So it's a typical process that happens at the end of your course. And then people would be made offers by different employees. Now in the campus placement, imagine that uh, this is this is you. So we'll take some example, maybe, maybe let's say Sagar from our class. Okay, so this is Sagar. And let us say that this is, uh, who is this? Come on, guys, tell me who is this? Sagar's friend. So this is uh, Sagar's uh, friend. All right. Now, uh, what happens is on the first day of the job, uh, first day of the campus placement, let's say that uh, Sagar's friend gets an uh, offer from one of the employer and the employer says that, okay, uh, you're looking at your background and education and everything. Uh, we are willing to offer you, let's say, uh, a starting number of $80,000. 
or let's let's make it a little more indian so let's say we're going to offer you uh, a starting number of let us say uh, i don't know how much let's say 12 lakh rupees or 1.2 million rupees okay so in india we use this denomination of lakhs 1 lakh is 100000 so we are going to offer you 1.2 million or 12 lakh rupees now the moment sagar's friend has been made an offer uh, there is something that's happening in sagar's mind right and i'm sure all the mbas engineers who are attending the class who have gone through campus placement at some stage in your lives uh, you must have experienced this uh, can you tell me on the chat box what what are you thinking right now you thinking that you know this friend of yours uh, in terms of academic you know academic score you know maybe this person was average uh, in terms of experience uh, you know the person was very low whereas sagar is sagar is kind of above average on academics he comes with large experience he's kind of street smart so what sagar must be thinking is that if my friend you know has got 12 i am definitely smarter than my friend so so maybe i should get at least at least 12 plus 3 maybe i should get at least 15 right do you, do you think this is how people think and just say yes or no to me okay it seems i've lost access to your chat box just give me a minute please sorry my apologies uh, something is wrong here Okay, I'm just trying to move your chat box to a different screen. It becomes easier for me to handle the Zoom session and uh, my writing pad. Okay, good. Now I have got access uh, to the chat box back. Yeah, so I'm saying, uh, would you agree that people think like this? That if that person, and it is not only in your campus placement, maybe it's in your office as well. right so self employed people different story but if you're in the office you always compare that you know this new guy came in uh, and this guy has no experience he's just you know student maybe a little bit of experience but why is he being paid so much and if he's paid this much then at least you know i should get this much and if you've ever thought of thought like this in your life then you have basically employed the principles of relative valuation because what you just did in a way is you kind of try to value yourself by company uh, you know you with someone else that is the relative valuation right comparing you with someone else and we kind of employ the same logic in financial markets when we are trying to value the stock so when you want to value let's say an automobile company let us say aishar motors right uh, so if you want to value an automobile company you probably compare that with how the valuation is of some some of the other two wheeler automobile companies in india for example uh, bajaj auto or hero motor corp so you look at their valuation and based on that you determine what should be uh, your valuation are we together on this is this making sense to you so let's get a little more technical with this now let's say we have three companies let's call them uh, for simplicity abc the total profit of the firm i'm going to throw in a technical term here we typically call this number as pat pat stands for profit after taxes profit after taxes so total profit of the firm uh, let us say in millions of dollars is is 100 million dollar is 150 million dollars and let's say 500 million dollars now you look at the uh, profit number and can you tell me out of these out of these three uh, which stock do you want to buy do you want to buy company a or b or c just just put this in the chat box company a or b 
all right those of you who who said just a minute i'm going to open up youtube so i can monitor that chat as well bit late click yeah so a b but the answer is you should say uh, you should say data is insufficient you should say that there is not not enough data for you to work with why because when you buying uh, you know shares of a company you're not buying the entire company so this entire profit is not necessarily belong to you you're going to buy few shares so another piece of information that you need is how many shares has the company has issued right for that profit what are the number of shares that the company has issued and i'm going to keep all the data in millions here uh, so number of shares in millions let's say this company has issued 10 million shares and this company has issued 7.5 million shares so this is in million this is in million and this company has issued this company has issued let us say 100 million shares so fine my profit is high my profit is high but isn't the number of shares issued also high so how much i am not going to buy all the shares i am going to buy one share of a company or two share of a company so i want to know what is the profit per share so profit per share is typically referred to as earning earning per share earning per share and what is earning per share what is your profitability on a per share basis okay so 100 divided by 100 million is the total profit divided by 10 million number of shares uh, can you tell me how much would be the profit per share Ten dollars, right? That's that's simple. Ten dollars. So here's your first formula for the day, and probably a very useful formula uh, to calculate something called as earning per share. Going forward, I'm going to refer to this number as simply EPS, earning per share. So how would you calculate that? You would take profit after tax divided by the total number of shares that the firm has issued. the total number of shares that the firm has issued so this becomes 10 can you tell me how much would be earning per share for firm b 150 divided by 7 and a half so this number is going to become this number is going to become 20 dollars and how about how about this firm this number is going to be 5 so now tell me are you going for a or are you going for b or are you going for c now a or b or c again make your pick come on i want everyone to uh, post it on the chat box make a pick whether you going to st for stock a or b or c most of you are saying that the stock b is what you want to buy and prime of it is that makes sense uh, because it it seems to have the highest earning per share however the correct answer is you should say data is not sufficient right because uh, this is the this is the return that you getting this is the profitability that the company is making per share but this is what you get we haven't compared the other part of it at the other angle that how much do i have to pay right we also have to pay something in the process so another important piece of information that we need is we need let me get rid of this thing so another information another useful piece that we need is what would be the what would be the market price of this stock now right what is the market price per share so let us say market price per share for this stock is Two hundred and fifty dollars. The market price per share for this stock is eight hundred dollars, and market price per share for this stock is hundred dollars. So now tell me, which stock are you going to buy? Are you going to buy A 
or you're going to buy B or you're going to buy C now. Think about it, look at the data points carefully. See, figure out if you can build some sort of a uh, thought process around it. Don't worry about formulas, just try to approach this logically. I'm getting a lot of C's here. The same guys were saying B <laughs> sometime back. Some of them are shifting to C. I'm getting a few Bs. Uh, we still have few people who are answering B. Couple of couple of guys are A. Okay. So here's what you do now. Some guys are playing safe. They, they're thinking this guy is in the business of trapping us. So maybe data insufficient is the safest answer all the time. Uh, so here's what you want to do now. What you're going to calculate is the legendary and uh, and a very popular ratio, a ratio that every you know so-called Tom, Dick, and Harry on the street knows about this ratio, uh, and that that ratio is called price earning multiple, a PE ratio or a price earning multiple ratio. Now, almost everyone you know who invests in markets would probably, if you go and talk to them, they would say that we know what price earning ratio is. And then generally what you know, you'd hear experts saying in the market is they would say that uh, since everyone knows this ratio, uh, this ratio is probably of no use, right? Since everyone knows this ratio, this ratio is no use. However, if you look at empirical evidence, there is plenty of empirical evidence that says that generally uh, having the right price earning ratio for the stocks that you're buying uh, results into better returns in the long run. So what works in favor of this ratio is what works against us that, you know, this comment that people make that everyone knows PE, everyone knows what PE is, which, you know, people make it sound as if it's a bad thing, but it's actually not. So what happens is because everyone knows PE, because everyone knows PE, then everyone acts on it, right? So for example, uh, you know, PE is not good. I'll, I will very soon I show you what do you mean by PE is not good, but everyone acts on it. And if everyone acts on it, then it kind of becomes uh, some sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Have you heard of this, this term before? Self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, so self-fulfilling prophecy means uh, <clears throat> it could be, uh, you know, it could be because all of us believe that when I do this, uh, this happens. For example, when PE ratio is, uh, generally people would say this, when PE ratio is too high, uh, when PE ratio is too high, then uh, the stock is expensive. Okay, so I'll, I'll show that to you very soon. So when the price ending ratio becomes too high, too high is, uh, I, I don't know, 70, 80, 100. So when PE is too high, the stock is expensive. And if the stock is expensive, then what should we do? If stock is very expensive, it's overvalued, what do you think we should do? Should we buy or sell if the stock is overvalued? Yes, if the stock is overvalued, we should sell. And then what happens is everyone sells, right? And, and if everyone is selling, uh, then do you think the supply will increase? And, and what do you think will happen then? The stock price will go up or go down? Stock price will go down. And that's how it kind of works in this cycle, right? So it's, see, one of the thing is that because everyone knows, for example, uh, everyone knows that, you know, Yes Bank was in trouble or Yes Bank wasn't doing good. And then everyone wanted to sell at some stage. And then we saw that the prices kind of declined. So all of us collectively, you know, when we think about a particular stock in a way, uh, then of course that stock is going to indicate that behavior. So one of the things that works in favor of price earning ratio is this concept of self-fulfilling prophecy. So the popularity of the ratio itself makes this ratio fairly uh, useful for us. 
and of course i'll be showing you how to make use of uh, the price selling multiples so coming back to calculation of pe ratio you know which is so important and probably you know one of the fundamental ratios you need to know to operate in the markets you calculate it like this and you think of it like this you would say that if i buy this share i'm going to the share is going to make a profit of about $5 every year and if it's making a $5 profit of every year and if i'm paying $100 to buy then i'm paying 20 times of that 5 to buy the stock i'm paying 20 times on 5 to get the stock that means the price earning multiple is 20 here or at times we also can call it as a earning multiple of 20 times so what do you mean by 20 times if i take this 5 and if i multiply it with 20 then what will i get 100 which means whatever is my profit i'm paying 20 times of that profit as my uh, market price i hope you're following this now uh, this is my 20 price earning multiple so can you do the same calculation here that profit is 20 and market price is 800 dollars so how many times are you paying how many times are you paying here you're paying 40 times right so that's how you want to look at this which means you've automatically figured out the formula the formula that we're using here is we're using the market price market price divided by earning per share so 800 divided by 20 40 and 240 divided by 10 how much 25 so in one case, you're paying 25 times. In one case, you're paying 40 times. In one case, you're paying 20 times. Now tell me, when you're buying a stock, do you want to pay more number of times of profit or do you want to pay less? That means, in general, do you want the price earning ratio to be higher or lower? Of course, it's higher. That's that's kind of the idea with markets. You want to buy low, you want to buy low, and you want to sell high. So, which means, in general, in general, subject to thousands of uh, disclaimers and asterisks and terms and conditions, in general, lower the price earning ratio better. Which means, again, we swivel back to C, and again, it looks like C is more attractive because the value of the stock is relatively lower in terms of its price earning multiple. Uh, have you understood this? Okay, so I'm going to take a small pause, maybe 30 seconds. Uh, it's just the first concept of the day. I'm still not getting too technical. It's, it's kind of weird in the warm up phase. Uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, uh, you can raise hands and then you should be able to speak. I'm just lowering all the previous hands and you'd have to raise your hands again now. Uh, so that I understand who wants to ask a question. Just raise your hands. I'll enable your audio. You should be able to speak. If you if you don't want to speak, you can post your query on the chat box as well. If, if you feel there's anything about P ratio you've not understood, please ask. Okay, it seems Siddharth would like to ask a question. Siddharth, you should be able to speak now. Yeah, uh, there is uh, there is a time I have heard about the PE ratio. So, if their analogy is like um, for earning, like I am taking the example of C. So, like earning one dollar, you have to spend twenty dollars. Is it the correct analogy? Uh, yes, that's correct. So, or, or you have spent twenty dollars so that you can earn one dollar. Yes. Same same way of looking at it. You're right. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Anyone else would like to ask any questions? Okay, Shubham, you should be able to speak now. Hello, good morning, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, I think it will be nice if you can be a little louder here. Would you be good to go? Uh, yes, sir. Sir, my question was, how will I determine the perfect PE ratio 
between different um, set of shares or securities sure uh, so we'll we'll reach there i mean uh, how do you determine uh, whether a p ratio is an attractive or not attractive uh, yeah <laughs> that is something that needs to be evaluated so right now i think we are slight a stage below where uh, you know the question that you are asking we just getting acquainted with what this pe ratio is and that's not the end game because uh, from the pe i'm going to take you to something called as the peg so that might get uh, uh, some of you the juices flowing uh, but we would be learning uh, something very interesting called peg very soon and that might help you determine what should be a good pe ratio sure sir thank you so much okay so now now let's look at a different way of looking at pe ratio we will probably continue with the example of company c uh, that we have we will just keep on working on this example so company c what was the market price per share for company c what was the market price market price was 100 market price was 100 and what was the earning per share right so earning per share is kind of think of it as how much is the profit that the firm is making per share so we're going to put this profit on a timeline okay so let's say this is time zero today you buy the share so when you buy the share when you buy the share that 100 went out from your pocket now in year 1 in year 1 your eps is 5 rupees or 5 dollars now let's assume that let's assume that this this assume let's assume that this is constant okay let's assume that this is constant 5 is the profit that the uh, company is going to earn five forever it's not going to change which means what we kind of assumed here is we assume that growth at which the profit will increase is zero there's no growth we just assuming that 555 will remain constant so now year 2 the firm remains earns five year 3 the firm earns five and you know the same keeps on going let's say year year 20 the firm earns five and it keeps on happening year 30 the firm earns 5 and we just assuming that the firm is able to earn 5 forever okay now i want you to think uh, forget you know all the finance that you've learned and just think like you know an, a person who's not really in finance background would approach this he would say 100 has gone out of my pocket and every year i'm receiving 5 so how many years will i take if i ignore time value of money all of that fancy stuff how many years will i take to recover my 100 back so first year i recovered 5 out of 100 second year now i have recovered total 10 third year i have recovered 15 so how many years will i take for me to recover the entire amount that i have invested so every year if i'm getting 5 and i want to get a total of 100 can you tell me how many years will it will i take okay it seems this apple function is giving me trouble to register it apple technology would complicate things for us just one minute guys i'm kind of constantly losing access to your chat box my apologies okay yeah it seems i've got answer from lot of you and uh, all of you saying that it is going to be 20 years which is spot on so all of you saying that it's going to be 20 years and that's spot on that's precisely the answer that i want you to give me 20 years so what and what was the pe ratio by the way what was the pe ratio pe ratio was also pe ratio was also 20 years right so 
which means which means and which kind of takes us to a really important point that p ratio is nothing but p ratio is nothing but time taken time taken to recover money time taken to recover initial investment right very broadly that's how you want to think of it time taken to recover initial investment but with the with the caveat and what's that caveat caveat is with with no growth so if the earning per share of the firm does not increase then uh, pe is going to be the time taken for you to recover your initial investment are we together on this now with this thought process i want to show some stocks to you so let's look at uh, let's let's pop up a screener dot in we we'll probably look at some of the indian stocks before we move on to so us stocks okay, so i'm using this website called screener dot in uh, it's it's one of the few websites in india where you can access a lot of data uh, and most of the data is free of cost so we will pick up uh, you know few stocks let's say uh, let's look at stock like maybe some of your popular give me names you know whatever companies you guys like okay let's look at tcs so tcs is an indian uh, private sector it company and it looks like it has a pe ratio of let's say 24 so if if there is no growth if there is no growth what do you think would be the time taken for you to recover money uh, that you invest for buying a tcs stock so you you're going to pay about 2000 rupees and if there is no growth it's going to take you about 24 years to recover the money that you've invested okay let's look at let's look at some more stocks uh give me give me some more names whatever names that come to your mind okay let's look at uh, itc it's a it's a tobacco and fmcg uh, company in india it has a price earning ratio of 16 the price earning ratio of 16 so which means it would take you about 16 years without any growth to recover your money now ideally what you want is you want to be able to recover your money fast now let us look at uh, a very popular stock in india these days we call this is avenue supermart and focus on avenue supermart is your dmart right so dmart uh, i'm sure you've heard of it uh, so dmart has a has a price earning multiple of 124 so which means if there is no growth in dmart if if you know the profitability kind of remains at the same level it's going to take you how many years it's going to take you about 125 years which means in this lifetime uh, because you know human lives we we would probably you know thinking that we might not be able to recover money uh, you know maybe the next generation would be able to get the whole payback but of course subject to a massive caveat what's the caveat what's the caveat uh there is a terms and condition to this analysis what is that that there is no growth right and that kind of takes us to the next set of our calculation so what would be now for next set of calculation i would need an excel file just so that uh, my calculations are a little fast okay so excel file just so that we can speed up things a little bit and now now it's getting technical maybe we are trying to reach to a practitioner level uh, or maybe somewhere in between you know an amateur investor and practitioner level but look at what i'm going to do is i'm going to have year here okay year so 1 2 1 2 3 4 four in this fashion will will have and as many years as required let's have maybe and let's have maybe 
125 years. Okay, 130 years. So we have 130 years here. Okay. Now let's start taking certain stocks, uh, whatever stocks that uh, you know you guys like, uh, whatever stocks that you win. Asking yourself whether I want to invest in them. Uh, so give me any names that come to your mind, and we'll probably uh, do an analysis on them. By the way, none of this, uh, a legal disclaimer, none of this is an investment advice of any sort. Please do not take investment decisions based on what we are doing today. We, this is just for educational purposes. Okay. So if you take one uh, company, we will have to take all the, uh, all the, we will have to take the same sector. So we would probably take something that's a little more comparable. Uh, so let's take let's take uh, IT companies in India. Maybe maybe they would be a little more comparable for us. We can take banking as well. Uh, let's start with IT first, just for the fun of it. So let us start with the legendary Infosys. Uh, so Infosys has a P ratio of 18.21. So let me quickly get my login done. So we'll get more data on screener. I'm just putting in my user ID and password here. Okay, so let's put in emphasis here. Infosys. So let's see what Infosys has. It has a earning per share of about 39 rupees. Uh, let's say if you can give us a EPS TTN. Okay. We'll just work with what we have. So current market price is 703.55. So let's plot that into our Excel file. Uh, okay, let's have one more column. So here we have stock, uh, which is uh, Infosys. Infosys has a current market price, current market price of 703, so 703. And it has the current EPS. Now it's a it's kind of a trailing EPS. So it has a EPS of uh, last year EPS of 39.10. 39.10. So now if I take EPS of 39.10 for each of the years, so look at my calculation. That if company makes a profit of 39.10, okay. So this is this is like their profitability for each of the year. Then uh, we'll assume that they will probably do it till you know all the years that we've forecasted here, till the entire horizon. So what we can calculate is we can calculate the cumulative profit. Okay, so what is cumulative profit? So cumulative, cumulative EPS. So cumulative EPS first year would be same as first year would be same as that thirty nine. But look at the second year. Second year would be a total of these two, right? Second year would be a total of these two. And I'm just using some Excel manipulation so that I can copy paste the same formula throughout the period. Uh, what I mean by that is the third year, when I want to take the total EPS, I want to take total of these years. Okay, and the fourth year, I want to take total of, I want to take total of these four years. So let's expand this for entire set. For whatever set we have here uh, for 20, 30, 40 years. Okay, so this is it. What we want to do is we want to see in what year my 703 is recovered. You know, in which year do I recover my 703 without any growth? So in the ninth year, we've recovered 351. In the 16th year, we've recovered 625. I hope all of you are with me. Uh, what was the investment? Investment was 700. So my 700, it seems, is recovered somewhere in the year 18. 
right? By the end of year 18, if I ignore all the time value of money, then I can confidently say in the 18th year, I have been able to recover, I have been able to recover my money. Now, uh, are you guys comfortable with this? Can you just give me a yes or no? It's same as your price earning ratio, right? 17th or 18th year, we recover the money. Good, and I hope you're enjoying this as well. Now what we will do is, we will bring in the third element, we'll bring in the third element, which is extremely important, is to appreciate the fact that my profit is not going to remain constant forever. My profit is going to change uh, or grow over a period of time at maybe some rate, right? At some rate, my profitability will keep on growing. So we call this as the growth rate. So now let's look at the historical growth rate of profit. So luckily screener does that calculation for us, uh, you know, free of cost. So in the last three years, the company's profit on an average has grown at the rate of 5%. In the last five years, it has grown at the rate of 5%. And if you take a maybe 10 year data, the profit grew slightly better. So it, sound, it seems like in the past, they were growing at good rate, but now the growth rate has uh, kind of slowed down significantly. So you ask yourself, fine, this is an you know, historical profit growth rate. Uh, I And that's where understanding of business kicks in. I understand Infosys. And now I feel that maybe they will not be able to grow faster than that 5%. Maybe I feel that, yeah, you know, just for the sake of example, I feel that going forward, Infosys will grow only at that 5%. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to assume an annual growth rate of 5% and change our calculation, okay? So change our calculation, how? So first year, when I calculate my, my earning per share of 39.1, instead of having 39.1, I'm going to use a formula here where I'm saying that grow my EPS, grow my EPS, of 39.1 at the rate of 5% every year. At the rate of 5% every year, we want to grow this uh, earning per share. Okay, so now the formula gets a little technical, but you can do it on a calculator also. What you do on your calculator, if you have a calculator with you, uh, type in 39.1 and just say plus 5%. So when you add 5% or grow it by 5%, 41, which means next year we're thinking maybe Infosys will have a profit of 41. And now I'm going to take the same, I'm going to take the same formula and grow. I'm going to take the same formula and grow Infosys profitability. So I'll just have to ensure I link it properly here, just a minute. So when I do that now, Let's see what happens. In year two, Infosys profitability will become 43. Then year three, it will become 45, right? We are just growing it at the rate of 5%. Now let us see how many years we are recovering our money back. So if I, if I look at this data now, then my 700 gets recovered somewhere between year 12 and year 13. So this is your payback period. This is your payback period after incorporating, after incorporating the growth rate. Now in isolation, what does it mean? Probably doesn't mean anything, right? So for Infosys, the, the time when we were able to recover money was 13 years. Now let's look at some more companies. So this Infosys analysis is done. Uh, let's take some more companies. Give me some more IT companies of your choice. Pick up a few more companies. Give me, give me some of those companies of your choice. Put them in the chat box. We'll probably pick up one of them. Okay, let's take, uh, let's take maybe one more large company before we go to relatively small size companies. So let us take the next company as uh, Infosys. 
Okay, just one minute. I'm trying to insert a free spin. Okay. So let us work with uh, TCS now. So let's go to screener and let's start doing some work on TCS. So TCS is one of the another private sector company in India. So TCS, uh, what price do we have? So we have a market price of 2048. So let's put that into our Excel file. So current market price of 2048, 2048. Then what is my current EPS? So let's figure out what's the EPS of TCS as of now. And the EPS last year was 86.24. So 86.24. Now, what is the growth rate? Again, the most important indicator when you want to look at this. So what's the growth rate? So let's look at the historical growth rate of profitability of TCS. So we'll probably work with last five years. And the moment you see this, you kind of observe that clearly, you know, there's a distinguish, there's a difference between Infosys and TCS uh, because Infosys was kind of growing at 5% in the last uh, five years, but it looks like uh, TCS has done a little better. They've grown at about 10.8 percentage, right? If you look at three-year growth rate, maybe that has slowed down a little bit. Maybe TCS is slowing down. We don't know. That's where, again, an understanding of business uh, kicks in. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume a, a number of 10.8 uh, here just to maintain consistency in our calculations. So I'll take number of 10.8 percentage. And then we'll do the same drill. We will calculate TCS's uh, EPS for each of the year. So look at how the calculation will work. In the first year, we will have EPS of uh, 86 increasing at the rate of 10%. You can do it on calculator also. 86.24 plus 10.8 percentage equal to. So you'd get next year EPS of 95. And after that, every year, every year EPS we will grow at that same rate. After that, every year we'll keep on growing EPS at 10, same rate. Okay, so let's keep on doing this, doing this over a period of time. Okay, so we have EPS now and let us calculate cumulative EPS. So cumulative EPS would be a total of all the EPS that we've earned so far. And let's take this formula for the entire period. Now, what we want to do is we want to see the year in which we recover our investment of 048. So roughly 2000, uh, it's changed. We are investing money. Can you see that? That investment is coming up somewhere in the year 12. So for somewhere in the year, so for TCS, we'll probably use, let's say, a blue color. So in case of Infosys, that money was, in case of Infosys, that money was coming to you in 12 years. But in case of TCS, in case of TCS, that money came back a little earlier, right? One year earlier, not significantly different. I'm just getting the right highlighting is this. Not significantly different, but it seems like at least, at least uh, TCS looks a little better. Uh, are you all together with me? Are you following what I'm trying to do with this? Okay, and I, I hope you're uh, enjoying I mean, if it becomes too technical, uh, please let me know. I'm trying to keep it easy for all of us, but uh, if it becomes technical, let me know. I'll try to slow down. Uh, let's take next company. Tell me, tell me some IT firm now within your choice. Let's look at some of the peers. Uh, pick one out of these. Take Mahindra, HCL. Just figure out which one you feel is more appropriate here. Let's look at HCL. Okay, let's look at HCL now. It's another private sector IT company. 
So HCL has a market price of 575. So let's quickly go back to our Excel file. Let's try to now speed up the process. So HCL has a market price of 505. Uh, then it has earning per share of 73.34. Earning per share, sorry, 30. I did not see that number properly. 37.34. 37.34. And what growth rate do we want to take, which becomes really important. So growth rate we want to take is, we'll take a five year uh, historical growth rate just to be consistent. And it seems like HCL has been growing at a crazy rate, right? So in terms of industry, it looks like HCL is uh, a little early than Infosys and uh, TCSs of the world because it's still been growing at fairly healthy rate here. So let's take a growth rate of 20% and let's give it a, maybe a pinkish or a reddish color code. Uh, okay, we'll take this orange. Now let's start calculating their EPS. So first year EPS would be last year's EPS growing at the rate of 20%. And then year after that, your EPS will keep on growing at the rate of 20% forever. Uh, that's the assumption we're making here. Okay, so this is going to be my profitability for next 10, 15, 20, whatever number of years. And let us calculate cumulative EPS now. So cumulative EPS of these two years. Now this is gonna get very exciting. So please stay alert. And this is cumulative EPS for next 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Again, what we want to see is we want to see in which year, in which year am I going to recover my money back? So first year profitability, uh, 4498, we want to reach 505. And can you see where is that 505 coming? It looks like it is coming way, way, way early uh, before the SS and TCS of the world. Can you guys observe this? So means when, you know, on the face of it, at based on what analysis we've done, it looks like H HCL is, uh, uh, assuming that they are, they are comparable, I mean, keeping that uh, threshold constant, it looks like HCL seems to be substantially better because we can recover the money faster. So that is the whole idea with this calculation. And if you just look at price earning ratio and isolation, they're not going to make sense. But if you look at the price earning ratio along with the growth rate that it offers, right? Then suddenly it makes sense. And that takes us to our next calculation, which is referred to as, which is referred to as the peg ratio. Okay, so instead of doing this and you know incorporating this into an Excel file, we can simply use a peg ratio. So we'll calculate peg ratio for all the three forms. So what did we have? We have Infosys, we had Infosys, we had TCS, and we had HCL. Is my screen visible to all of you? A black color screen? Good. So first we calculated their market price. So from our Excel file, we'll fetch that data. So first we calculated their market price. And Infosys 7032048, 7032048, and HCL was 5.05. So these were the market price. Then what was their earning per share? So earning per share, which is nothing but profitability per share. So Infosys was 39. 0.1, uh, TCS was 86.24. And HCL was 37.34, so 37.34. So then we calculated their price earning ratio, right? So can you guys help me with uh, 70, 703 divided by 39.1? If you can do the math and post it on the chat box. Guys, 703 divided by 39.1. Please, please do the math. Okay, how much is that? 
nine, eight for the first one. Let's do for TCS, please. Give me for all the three stocks. Give me TCS and HCL as well. TC is how much? 23 point, 23 point 75, which is 2048 divided by 86. And finally, 505 divided by 37.34. So that's 13.52. So even if we had looked purely on the basis of HCL, uh, uh, on the basis of P ratio, we would have probably been more inclined towards HCL anyways, right? Because the P ratio is low. But then one doubt that should run out my mind is, okay, maybe, maybe I'm getting HCL at a very low valuation. Maybe HCL is very cheap, but is it because the stock is not growing? Right? That could be a reason because you don't want to pay a lot for a company that's not growing. So you bring in the, the growth rate, you bring in the growth rate and let's plot, let's plot this growth rates into our chart. So Infosys growth rate, we assume to be five. PCS we took 10.8 and observe how I'm not writing them as a percentage uh, for this particular formula. I'm just writing them as 10.8, not 10.8 percentage and HCL 20. And then we will calculate the, the legendary peg ratio. The peg ratio. How do you calculate the peg ratio? So we take price earning multiple divided by the rate at which the profitability of the company is expected to grow. So help me with this 17.98 divided by five. 17.98 divided by five. Tell me how much is this? That's going to be 3.6. 27, 23.75 divided by 10.8. Divided by 10.8. 2.2 or 2.1. And 13.52 divided by 20. This is 0.68. And clearly, you know, this looks substantially more attractive this looks substantially more attractive. Assuming everything else is constant and the business are on reasonable trajectory, you know, assuming everything else is constant, on a peg level as well, it looks like HCL is a smarter bet than Infosys and PCS. Right? That's how you want to look at the, the legendary peg ratio from a stock analysis or a valuation perspective. Have you guys understood this? Good. Now, in one of your actual uh, CFA level one equity class, I would take this at a substantially higher late level. This is still level zero. This is still, you know, beginners. So I'm keeping things nice and easy. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to shut up for a minute and let you guys talk. So if you have any questions on Excel file that I built or uh, Excel file that I built, or if you want to, uh, on this analysis or this concept, uh, you can keep on posting the question or you can raise hand and I would be happy to answer them. Uh, let me just lower all the previous hands so that I know the new ones. Okay. So in case, if you would like to speak, uh, you can raise your hands now. The first question is coming from Chetan. Chetan, you should be able to speak now. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, sir, actually, my hi. question was uh, regarding the growth percentage that we have taken into consideration. So we are not taking into consideration the growth which will happen in the stock price uh, while doing this cal calculation. Uh, we are just taking the profit percentage increase, right? And not the growth in the stock price. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so, like, I'm just asking this: Are we taking the stock price increase in calculation as well? Like, doing this? No. no, 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 no. We're not taking stock price increase in calculation. Uh, this growth rate is the growth rate of the profits, uh, not of the stock price. And you don't want to take growth rate of the stock price. I mean, in this formula. And uh, anyways, there's no way to know what's the growth rate of the stock price. We're taking growth rate of profits. Now, yeah, what you could counter me is you can say, Utkash, you've taken historical uh, growth rate. Uh, 
uh, which are not necessary the growth rates in the future, which I completely agree. For example, HCL, it seems in the past five years, it has grown profits by 20%. But does it mean it will keep on growing profits of 20% in future? Uh, maybe yes, maybe not. We don't know. Uh, that's where uh, your understanding of business comes in. So maybe instead of, if, for example, if I had to invest in HCL, I'll probably spend, you know, you know, a lot of time learning about business, what's driving the business, uh, what are the reasons why they're growing so fast. And then based on that, uh, based on that, then I would determine whether, uh, what would be a future growth rate, whether it should be 15, it should be 20, or maybe it should be 25. But in general, the rule is lower the peg ratio, better it is because uh, you would be able to recover your money faster. You're paying less uh, for the value of the business. Uh, in a way compared to his competitors because you, you're getting a cheaper deal, you would be able to recover your money faster, right? And I proved you with the help of this Excel file that when the peg ratio is lower, uh, we were able to recover kind of all the money in seventh year as against uh, Infosys where we recovered the money in 12th year and PCS where we recovered the money in uh, 12 years. So that's the whole idea with peg ratio. So hopefully Chetan, I answered your question. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else would like to ask? Raise your hands. Okay. We have Prerna here. Prerna, you should be able to speak. Thank you, sir. So my question is with regards to peg ratio, we're looking at historical growth, uh, but we are not considering the fact that anything could go wrong in these sectors in the coming years. So I'm sure there'll be further uh, analysis added to this valuation. And this is not the only thing that we look at while selecting stocks, right? No, definitely not. This is, I think there's no single magic formula in markets. Uh, I mean, it would have been so nice, right? You look at one formula and that does the job for you. Uh, but unfortunately, or fortunately, so to say, because that's why people like you and me have jobs. Uh, a single formula, single formula doesn't work. Uh, but this is a, uh, if I, if you, you know, ask me to probably pick my top five formulas when I'm looking at stocks, this would definitely fall into, uh, definitely in my top five list. It's an extremely uh, useful formula. The growth rate, as I said, uh, uh, to uh, response to previous query also, right now we've taken historical profit growth rate. Why? Because we, we are in the class, we want to do it fast. Uh, but if you are actually planning on investing into a stock, you spend a few hours, read annual reports, you know, read some conference call uh, uh, transcripts and you try to understand whether they'll be able to grow at the uh, same rate uh, going forward. Maybe the growth rate would be higher, especially for small size companies. Maybe the growth rate would be lower and then you put that growth rate into your calculation. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Drupal, go ahead, sir. Uh, hi, sir, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so I just wanted to know that what are some of the downsides of, uh, you know, relative valuation over DCF? Mm -hmm. Or maybe, okay. uh, or, or maybe you know, uh, which is uh, like, of course, DCF must be more precise. But then do we still use relative valuation? Or if we use, then where is it used? So just would like to know on this. Okay, that, that's a great question. Uh, so I think most of the class, they might not know what DCA valuation is at this stage uh, because I have not uh, gotten into details. Uh, but whether we use, when do we use relative, when do we use DCF? I think, uh, you know, typically I, I would end up using uh, both the metrics when I'm trying to value a stock. Uh, I kind of, I kind of use for my personal uh, stock picking, I use a hybrid between a DCF and uh, relative value that's that's slightly more complicated uh, probably inside an actual class you would have uh, a level one equity class uh, i might show you someday uh, but both of them are useful uh, dcf gives you a little more flexibility it allows you to incorporate your opinion about the business you know for example let's say reliance industry today now reliance industry traditionally was in the petrochemicals business in india uh, then they got into telecommunication business and they, I mean, and, and they're also into retail there now uh, and they're probably getting into fintech and finance uh, eventually. So uh, one of the benefit that you have with DCF is you get plenty of flexibility for modeling, but then that flexibility might also come at the cost of you getting things wrong. 
so there's a uh, pros and cons of using uh, both the methods in practice but uh, hang on for some time let's you know dig a little deeper maybe you would get answers to some of your questions okay anyone else wants to speak uh, you can raise your hand prerna i'm i'm guessing your query is resolved Yes, sir. Shitij, you should be able to speak now. Sir, uh, any reason for IT growth rates be declining since the last few years? <laughs> uh, that that would take us to a different discussion altogether. Maybe I I'm not sure if the class really uh, deserves, and neither am I an expert on IT sector. Uh, I think in my financial modeling class we were. having a discussion on the similar lines with one of the participants a couple of weeks back uh, i'm no expert but uh, i would say uh, you know the way i look at it stocks is uh, the traditional it business uh, with the likes of tcs and infosys which i i believe are kind of kind of commodity businesses they just you know cost sharing centers for uh, the investment banks and pharma companies in the west Absolutely. and then the innovative category of it business so i believe you know the cost advantage that india had historically with within the it space we we kind of losing the edge now uh, because you know indonesia is competing with us philippines is competing with us so, so tech skills have been developed all over the world uh, that could be one of the reasons why uh, you know there has been a slow down uh, and i think another important reason is a uh, lot of our indian companies might have not been able to innovate Uh, IT companies have not been able to innovate uh, the speed at which ideally they should have. Uh, that's also affecting. But again, that's a discussion for another day. Maybe today is might not be a good idea. Okay, all right. Uh, so that's what I had for peg ratio. Now I have an assignment for you. I have taught you how to do the peg ratio. uh i have not taught you how to do the valuation by the way just the uh, we've not got into valuation part of it I'll, i'll take you there very soon but what you guys do is uh, this is your assignment for this week so next week again i would do one more session on equity valuation uh, i originally thought i'll be able to finish them in three but now it looks like i need uh, four of them uh so next week when you guys come in i want you to calculate the peg ratio Uh, for let us say players in indian footwear industry okay so look at the the peg ratio of uh, footwear industry so footwear which all players we have we have uh, relaxo we have bata uh, we have liberty then we might have uh, we have another company called khadim and we might have one more company called shri leather so we have this five guys in the listed universe uh yeah we have mirza as well thank you arnav so we have mirza international so calculate peg ratio for these uh, five six people and then uh, come to me and tell me what do you think is the most attractive bet within the space uh then take one more industry uh you can take maybe fmcg now fmcg we have plenty of players so you can probably take uh, you know hul nestle take marico take dabur and i'm sure i'm missing a lot of them uh, take zydus wellness and then calculate peg ratio on all of them zydus wellness okay these are some of the players we have in the uh, players we have in the footwear uh, the fmcg industry and then uh, come to me with one pick based on the peg ratio uh, out of these companies which one you feel is most attractive and uh, out of fmcg which company you feel is most attractive Are we okay here? Okay. So now, in next section, which is which is going to be fast, I'm going to show you how to value how to value a stock using, of course, back of the envelope calculation using a simple PE multiple using PE multiple. okay so uh, 
let's pick up a, a sector here. Let's pick up a sector. Tell me your industry where you, you would like this valuation method to be applied. Avoid banking. Banking, which generally you know wouldn't do a price earning multiple. Uh, chemicals is too vast uh, to apply. So chemical might not be uh, good space. Packaging, maybe we can. Automobile, we can. FMCG, we can. Uh, uh huh. Okay. All right. Let's do. Uh, let us do FMCG uh, because we'll have reasonable number of companies there. Uh, so let's start with uh, Hindustan Unilever. Okay. So these are uh, some of the peers of the company. So we have Hindustan, Colgate, PNG, Gillette. Okay, I am not sure how uh, how well the comparison is. And let's look at some of the peers of Nestle. Okay, I think this is a reasonably good database for us to work with. So here's what I want you to do. What I want you to do is, uh, and we, we probably can do it on screener itself. We'll take, we'll define FMCG as an industry for us to work with. And these are some of the players that we have now. Uh, Bajaj consumer will probably get rid of it. Uh, slightly different uh, structure. Kaya, we will get rid of it. But we would take these five companies. And what we would do is we will assume that uh, we will assume that using these companies, we want to value, let us say, Godrej consumer. So that's the valuation that we want to do right now. Okay, we want to do back of the envelope calculation for Godrej. So this number is not uh, is not something that we're going to use we're going to use everything else and of course these companies we've decided not to work on so let me just come out directly hide that okay so just to give you a sense on how relative valuation works what we have is we have a few competitors here we have dabur we have mariko imami and jyoti labs all of them have their own price earning ratios so dabur dabur has a price earning ratio of 53 and uh, Mariko 40, Imami 26, Jyoti 24. Now you take this four price earning ratio. Of course, this is back of the envelopes and maybe maybe a little naive, uh, but we're learning, right? So we're just trying to build a thought process on how relative valuation works. So take this four price earning ratio, 53, uh, 40.43, then we have 26 and we have 24. Take these exact numbers and take an arithmetic average of them, please. Take an arithmetic average and tell me how much is that number. Take an average PE ratio of these four people. Average PE ratio of these four guys and tell me what is the number. So average PE ratio is coming out to be approximately approximately 36.4 okay how did you calculate an arithmetic average you just you just take a total of these and then divide them with four now please listen to me carefully what it means is in this fmcg sector uh, based on the definition or classification system of screener which which we can debate about but let's assume that this universe is okay if company on an average, if company has an EPS of one, if it has an EPS of one, then it, sh it should have a, a market price of 36.4, right? The market price is 36.4 times of the earning per share. If EPS becomes two, then this becomes double. 
So this becomes approximately 72.8, right? So as the EPS is increasing, the market price becomes uh, 72.8. So all of the market price on an average is 36.4 times of the profit. Now let's go and find out what is the profit of Godrej consumer so that we can uh, work with this. Let me see if screener allows me to edit this column here and I would just add I will just add EPS to the list. Let's see if it's bringing EPS now. How oh, good it has brought in the EPS. Uh, Godrej consumer is what we were hiding, right? Okay. Now Godrej consumer has EPS of how much? So look at this number. Godrej consumer has an EPS of 14.63. So going by the industry standards, if Godrej GCPL, Godrej consumer products limited, if it has an EPS of 14.63, then can you figure out at, a, at the rate of 36.4 a P multiple, what should be the valuation? So take this 14.63 and multiply with 36.4. Take this 14.63, which is the EPS of Godrej, and multiply that with 36.4. And how much is that? It's 532 or maybe 533. So according to the, and this is probably, you know, your first valuation for many of you attending class today. Uh, so according to a relative valuation model based on price earning multiple, a very uh, back of the envelope naive calculation without really getting into nitty gritties, it looks like uh, the, the correct value that one should pay for buying Godrej is about 533. But can you see what is the current market price of the stock? The current market price of the stock is, sorry, I'm not sure what happened here, just a minute. Yeah, the current market price of the stock is 649. And if current market price is 649, what's your take? Whether the stock is uh, overvalued or undervalued? Whether the stock is overvalued, right? That is how you typically do a relative valuation. You compare your valuation with someone else. So comparing with someone else's valuation, and then uh, determining your own valuation, similar to the analogy that I used at the beginning of the class. A bunch of students in the class, one guy gets a job, the other people start comparing, if he's got this much, I should get how much, right? So we did the same. If other stocks are getting a PE of 43, 53, 40, 26, 26, then on an average, my competitors are getting a PE of 36. So if I have a profit of 14, and if I get P of 36, my valuation becomes 533, but my valuation is 649. So on a relative valuation basis, it looks like it's a little overvalued. And overvalued means should we buy or should we not buy? What, what do you think? Should we buy or not? Overvalued means that we, we should probably not buy or maybe we should also consider uh, selling the stock, right? Again, we just learning, these are uh, you know early days, so there is a lot more to it than what I'm showing to you right now, but we will slowly, slowly build up. But what I'm showing to you in the long run, this thing works. There's a lot of empirical evidence that says that generally uh, relative valuation uh, works generally. Okay, so do you, want to, do you want to use this technique on some other sector? Should we practice on some other sector? Okay, uh, let's do some more. Let's just for the fun of it. Uh, banking, I'm not sure if you should value on a, on a earning multiple. Let us take, uh, now within pharma, actually there are different types of pharma business, uh, but fair enough, let's 
you know, let's ignore that for a while and let's just work on this level. So now what we will do is we will assume that all of these are kind of competitors. To be honest, they're not. Uh, Biocon is definitely, you know, not to be put in the list. Uh, can we take an average of all five? No, you should not take average of the form that you're using, uh, which you're going to use for valuation. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to value, value Arbindo Pharma. I want you to value Arbindo Pharma. Uh, based on the, the PE method that I've taught you. Okay, let's see if you can do that. All the data that you need that is available for you on the screen. So value Arbindo Pharma. Or uh, intrinsic value, by the way, that's the term the analyst will throw at you. They will say that this is intrinsic value. How much is the uh, stock justified or how much is it worth? So valuation of Arbindo. So to figure out whether the stock is undervalued or overvalued. and give me a valuation as well. Give me a number on what valuation you've reached at. So when you put in the answer in the chat box, the valuation as well as the valuation as well as conclusion. Okay, guys who are on YouTube, uh, my apologies. I did not have access to the chats which were coming my way. Uh, but now, now I can uh, see some of your chats and I'll try to answer. Uh, Reselecting re Revolter, I'll try to answer your queries as well, sir. Uh, you can keep on posting your questions here. Okay. All right. Let's do let's do valuation together. So here's how here's how we're going to do the valuation. Uh, we will take an average of all these P ratios, and right now we're working on arithmetic averages, right? So just the total divided by number of observations. So can you please take a total divided by number of observations and tell me how much? What is the average P ratio here? Hi Priya. Average P ratio is 32.37. Good. 32, 32 32.37. So this is the average P ratio. And what is the EPS of Orbindo? EPS is 48.31. So you multiply with 48.31. And what is your valuation? What's your intrinsic value? So you multiply these two numbers. How much do you get? You get one five six four. Okay, one five six four. So based on this method, it looks like uh, the valuation of the stock of Arbindo is one five six four. Uh, what is the current market price? The current market price is seven forty four, and based on that, it looks like it looks like the stock is. What do you think? Overvalued, undervalued. It looks like the stock is undervalued. The stock is undervalued. And uh, then what's your conclusion? Do you, do you want to buy or sell? So of course the conclusion is that uh, we should buy the stock. Good, you guys are picking up. 
want to do one more one last industry okay all right last one mm, which sector okay let's do auto a lot of people want to do auto here uh so we'll we'll probably do a two wheeler space let's say okay let's work on the auto space not enough players so Mm -hmm. Okay, Aishar Bajaj Hero uh, TVS. Am I missing any one in two wheeler space? Or oh, you've covered everyone? Right, so these are some of the two-wheeler uh, players that we have in the space. Uh, so based on this information, let's see if we can value. Uh, if we can value, let us say, uh, I don't know, let's value Bajaj Auto maybe. We take this information and come up with a valuation of Bajaj Auto. So we have price to earning of all of these guys and we have the EPS as well. So let's do a valuation for Bajaj. Yeah, I mean, is it a, is it a perfect comparison? Maybe not because uh, every company like you, Maybe a big part of Aisha is comparable, not all all part of it. And uh, we're not really you know, looking at business right now. We're just working on the numbers. Clearly for me, uh, if I have to pick one, uh, Aisha for me scores all the way. Uh, I, I kind of love Aisha for the... Uh, Aisha is, by the way, uh, Royal Enfield. Right? And I, I kind of love Aisha for the fact that they've been able to build an incredible brand uh, for themselves, uh, you know, going forward. I see a lot of people wearing those uh, Royal Enfield jackets and, uh, you know, that gang of guys who typically 50, 60 bikes running together. And we wouldn't see that happening with any other company. So they've, they've been able to build a cult. So to clearly for me, you know, Aisha is attractive, but let's, let's just do the numbers. Let's see if we can do a valuation. So give me an average P ratio now. Give me what's an average P ratio here. How much is that? 21.16, okay. And what is the EPS of Bajaj? So EPS of Bajaj is 180. So what's your valuation? What's your valuation? It's going to be 3811.5. Right, and uh, what is the current market price? The current market price of Bajaj. Okay, uh, your valuation is thirty eight hundred, and current market price of Bajaj is uh, twenty seven hundred. So, based on you know this analysis that we've done, what would you say? Overvalued, undervalued? It is undervalued, and then you'd probably buy. Again, my disclaimer. Uh, this, uh, some of this is oversimplified, okay? Since we are learning, uh, it's coming at the cost of oversimplification, which again, so do not, do not think that you've figured out, you know, how to value stocks just based on this session. Uh, as I said earlier, there's a very long curve to the learning process, but, uh, and there are a lot of other things that you want to evaluate, especially the qualitative aspect that I spoke in, my previous sessions on equity valuation with you. 
in terms of uh, remember those Warren Buffett four rules that we discussed, right? Uh, businesses we understand long term favorable economics. So all of those go all of those areas will go in uh, you know typically into analysis like this. But if you have to take one thing away from uh, one thing home from today's session, uh, which is actually very practical and it works in the market and is a very powerful tool, is this ratio that I discussed some time back, which is a a peg ratio. So I have benefited immensely from you know this thought process uh, on the peg. Of course, how to calculate growth is anyone's guess. Uh, you can you don't want to get make it too complicated. You work on historical growth. Uh, if you feel that you have the time and the bandwidth, you can study the stocks yourself and uh, forecast the future growth rate, whichever way. But this is a fairly powerful tool, and this tool will definitely help you. Uh, at least the tool will not, you know, protect you from making some stupid errors. Uh, at times, you would see some stocks trading at exorbitant valuation, uh, you know, not making sense. So Peg will bring some sort of a sanity into how do you want to look at uh, some of the stocks. Uh, so with this now, I think uh, more or less uh, what I plan to cover is done. I still need to cover two more types of valuation and some small, small items with you. Uh, so in the next week, I will do my last equity valuation class. And then we will move on to uh, the using of the calculator and more technical parts of CFA. Okay, so we have about 12 minutes left into the session. Uh, if you guys want to ask any queries, including the ones on YouTube, uh, now your query could be on any of these fronts. Uh, you can ask ask questions on about the session that we did today. You can ask questions on uh, CFA preparation, FRM preparations. Uh, you know, if you want to ask questions on books, careers, whatever, uh, we have about twelve to fifteen minutes, uh, so you can ask these questions. Uh, can I upload old sessions? Yes, Anup. Uh, this series of equity valuation that I'm doing for CFA level one, uh, originally I planned for three. Now they're going to be four sessions and all these sessions are available on YouTube. Uh, so what I'll probably do is I'll create a playlist out of it once I've finished with the fourth video. Uh, but if you want to watch them before this, uh, just go to Fintry channel and look for the last three uh, classes of CFA level one. Okay, Shitij, just a question on CFA. Uh, okay, so Shitij has asked a question. Uh, is CFA really valued on a standalone basis from a career perspective? Uh, or is some other qualification necessary like MBA, for example? Okay, that's a great question, Shitij. So see, it's it really depends on what you want to get uh, out of your career. Okay, for me, uh, the way the way I look at things is uh, all all this certification structure for your learning, but at the end of the day, it okay. There's a small internet lag at my side. I'm hoping it will improve fast. Uh, maybe it's happening on YouTube as well. Uh, can you guys still hear and see me properly? Guys, am I? Okay. All right. My apologies for it. I think it's, it's my internet. Yeah. So I was saying, uh, see, it, it gives you a platform. And what you want is you really want to learn and extract, you know, the value that the curriculum is providing and then leverage on that knowledge in your career. Uh, so, uh, whether CFA is good enough on a standalone basis, I would say definitely yes. Uh, I've seen a lot of, lot of case studies over the period of time as students, uh, you know, who just on the basis of this single designation have done uh, phenomenal in their careers. Some of our students are now uh, fund managers and managing, uh, you know, there's one guy who manages about 800 crores. Uh, there's one fellow who might become fund manager in next few months. Uh, there are a lot of investment bankers. So, so whether CFA is, uh, even from a standalone perspective, whether it's good enough, I think completely yes. As long as your objective is to learn and extract value and not you know, just have a certification. That I feel is just outrightly stupid. But uh, 
but especially in indian context uh, what happens is uh, unfortunately uh, the the hr community uh, has some sort of a prejudice or some sort of a preset notion of looking at things so there is one particular area where i feel uh, it is become a little difficult for just a cfa to get in is the front office investment banking okay now not everyone wants to be in front office ib i mean i on the outside it looks very attractive on the outside we feel like we want to be investment bankers but uh, trust me the life once you're inside is not as as sexy as what you know they show us on the movies and what we hear from people uh, but if you feel that front office mb front office investment banking is your thing you street smart you can you know pull off uh, talking to people and all of that stuff uh, then i think a mba in the long run helps but like an mba from either the top 3 schools in india or uh, the ivs in the us uh, so if you feel you can pull that up then i think mba is definitely uh, one of the available options okay shubham uh, in terms of assignment okay so i have to monitor the youtube chat as well uh fico i did not understand your question i'm planning to start my cfa okay sorry my youtube app crashed is it is it only me or even you guys are having trouble my uh, youtube is has been miserable for me in the last 10 15 days i i, I don't know it just just keeps on crashing all the time okay so fico says i'm planning to start my cfa class how papers can i do on level 1 okay uh, fico I, i'm sorry i did not understand what you really mean to ask there all right next question is is what is what videos to watch this week okay we done good i i like your motivation so last week i i i asked you to watch the time value of money videos from uh, level 1 quant uh, how many of you finished it can you just say me on the chat box did you finish all level 1 time value funny videos okay that's impressive that, that's really nice i'm happy okay so here's here's what I, what i want you to do uh, if you finished if you finished time value funny video i'll anyways be doing your class on this by the way uh if you finish the time value funny videos of uh, cfl level 1 quant then uh this week i want you to finish this week i want you to finish the capital budgeting reading from corporate finance okay so i am not going to start with uh, tvm directly i'm going to start most probably your class with capital budgeting or maybe with fra uh, that depends on you know where we are in about two weeks from now uh, but capital budgeting is again closely linked to what we did in time value of money uh, it just teaches you a couple of new functions it's a fun reading to work with uh, so go to corporate finance of cf level 1 and watch the videos on capital budgeting okay you should easily be able to finish it off in a week's time and then those people who've not done tvm please do them now okay and of course i am operating on the assumption that all of you have finished your level 0 so you do your level 0 you watch tvm videos from level 1 quant and then you do capital budgeting from corporate finance uh, first reading in corporate finance and if you do that i think you you you're making good progress in the class regarding your weekly test uh, we would start them uh, maybe from the last week of june i'm still taking things very slow uh slowly slowly will start building momentum these still early days for us how many papers do i do on level 1 to finish the level uh fico could is just there's just uh, okay so your question is about cf level 1 so there's just one exam for cf level 1 and uh, if you're writing the exam in 2020 uh that means this this year in december then it's going to be a 6 hour exam 
uh, morning 9 to 12 and afternoon 2 to 5 and 10 subjects. Can I take the session on effective duration and effective convexity? Uh, I think I do have that session, uh, Priya, on YouTube. Uh, but maybe, maybe when I'm teaching fixed income, I'll try to broadcast that on YouTube again, uh, in case if that's what you're struggling with. Any update on FRM part two classes? Uh, Mihir, yes, uh, I've started working on my calendar. Uh, most probably third week of June, I would start uh, recording some of the new content that has been released in 2020. Uh, but the online video, it's it's available on the website now. Uh, we've opened up, uh, we've opened it up for uh, signing up process. Uh, so right now, in terms of content, about let's say about 30% of the content uh, is mine uh, or 30 or 35%. 35% content is of another instructor uh, and uh, about 30% content doesn't exist because those were the additions in 2020. Uh, so what I would be doing is I would be adding uh, another 30, 35% content this season. Uh, so by October this year, we will have 100% coverage on FRM part two, out of which about 65 to 70% coverage would be mine, uh, my videos and 30% content would be from our other instructor. Uh, so that's roughly how we are uh, working on FRM part two at this moment. Uh, I would be taking the classes live online and uh, we would not really be doing a classroom program. Uh, so what, what is going to happen is uh, in case if you're interested, you just need to sign up for the online program, which is on Pintry side. And uh, then whenever I do the sessions uh, live online, uh, you'd automatically be shared access to it. So either you attend them live or you can watch the videos later on from the same sessions. Okay. Uh, Prerna, uh, just reach out to the admin team. Uh, quiz, I think is available inside the Platinum program. So if you sign up for Platinum, you should get access to it. So just, just talk to the admin team and see if, if you can get access to it. Uh, Sagar, do we have videos of the previous classes I've taken in this batch? Yes, Sagar, all those videos are on YouTube. Uh, so just go to Fintry channel and search for last two or three uh, CF level one classes. You'll be able to see all of it. All right. Uh, what else we have? We have, uh, if we study 2020 books, can we give an exam in 2021? Or we have to restudy 2021 syllabus? All right. So uh, good news is that 2020 and 2021 curriculum is going to be same. Uh, so which, which basically means uh, if you have 2020 books, there are going to be no changes except uh, the exam pattern, because I'm sure you know that 2021 onwards, uh, the exams are going to be online and they're going to be four times a year. Uh, but, but as far as the curriculum is concerned, it's going to be same. That's not, there's not going to be any change there. Okay, by the way, before I forget, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just bringing this up randomly, but uh, uh, please like, comment, and subscribe. I mean, like only if you like the video, but in case if you do, uh, then please like on the uh, on the YouTube video. All right, next question. Uh, can we access... Okay, thank you, Pran. I appreciate it. Can you access Fintry placement service after level one? All right. Uh, so the way a Fintry placement works is uh, there are certain programs for which uh, placement access is available. So at the time of sign up, you need to... Uh, at the time of sign up, you need to check whether your program has uh, eligibility for placements. If yes, then uh, if yes, then uh, my team will reach out to you. Uh, so we've kind of changed the method now. We were operating slightly differently on placements. Uh, so we we kind of figured that there was a lot of uh, misuse on uh, some of the services that we we had. Uh, so now what's going to happen is my team will reach out to you by the end of this month. Uh, for those of you who are eligible for placements, you'll have to fill up a form and then we kind of design an onboarding process. Uh, there's no cost there, but once you're onboarded into the placement uh, portal or placement uh, broadcast, uh, then you'd automatically start receiving a lot of notifications. Uh, this placement, by the way, is a lifetime service, which means uh, once you're inside the system, then you... Now for the rest of your life, you can access all the opportunities that we uh, generate. And uh, then you would keep on receiving different notifications and openings and you just apply to the ones that you feel are relevant. 
okay guys uh, maybe last two or three questions uh, all right uh, can you please clear this this is coming from youtube can you please clear this question before ending the class time period of roi is same as pe how roi is calculated for different investment scenarios okay uh, uh, that is a relatively uh, uh, technical question to answer uh, there are different definitions of return on investment uh, for me the the definition that i generally use is the roce metric which is return on capital employed uh, which is typically an annual return on the money that you've invested now if your question is with respect to that pe ratio that i was uh, doing that is not roi that's called the payback period uh, that's called the payback period uh, that was not the roi and uh, how do i calculate roce or roic so i in general i'm more comfortable with roce number and roce is uh, return on capital employed which i typically calculate as nopat divided by uh the capital employed what score of cfa all levels do interviewer consider good okay there is no such thing as uh, you know a particular score is considered good in fact uh, people don't even bother about you know what score you have as long as you have passed the exams no one is going to ask you how much you scored on cfa exam unless and until you go ahead and tell them so i i don't think that's something you want to worry about but of course if you get yourself in the 90th percentile that means 90th percentile is like kind of the best score that you can score on cfa exam then that's always a good thing to have if eps is negative how to interpret intrinsic value uh, abhishek if eps is negative you don't have to use p e ratio you can always use price to earning you can use price to sales price to book value there are a lot of other metrics of valuation we solely solely still reaching there okay uh, last two questions i have another class starting in 20 25 minutes anup says if i want to uh, sign up just for the weekly test how can i do that so anup we we don't have that option uh, available Uh, you cannot sign up separately uh, just for the weekly test now uh, what what you can do though is uh, uh, just talk to admin and check with them if they can if you are allowed to sign up for uh, separately for fintris question bank uh, so for level 1 we have about uh, 5000 questions just check with them if that option is available and if yes i think that that would serve as good as a as a weekly test uh, but if you need the weekly test specifically the ones that we create i think you you get access to them only once you are inside the uh, the the traditional program that we run okay last question uh last question is nehal tivekar is fintri providing all the required study material any external material recommended okay uh so nehal uh, if i'm guessing if you if you signed up for the platinum uh, thing that we have uh, you basically get access to everything that you need you get juice notes question banks uh, q and a videos computer notes i i don't really think you need to buy anything else uh, that that's going to be more than sufficient uh, as long as you have access to uh, all the content what lies in there uh, don't buy any external material in fact you would not be using it uh, do not buy the schweizer notes uh, of course get access to curriculum that's going to be handy soft copy hard copy is okay uh, but you don't need any other material apart from that so cfa curriculum and fintry content that's more more than sufficient that to, for what you need to pass the exams okay last question are uh, these sessions going to be 2 hours in upcoming weeks so next next two weeks at least we are operating on a 2 hour format and after that i would be shifting you to a 4 hour class uh, so at least for next two classes we are still on the 2 hour format okay guys so with this uh, i'll take your leave again uh, i i know i've not been able to answer all the questions but you you have uh, access to our uh, my colleagues at fintry uh, 
so you can either call them or write them an email and uh, all of us would be happy to help you so stay motivated yeah, keep on studying uh, there is a lot of importance to you know what we guys are learning because once we really learn the stuff we can help a lot of people manage their finances and you know solve financial troubles and uh, this is an important job and you know lot of people's financial health depends on how seriously you take your studies so keep on studying and keep on enjoying the stuff i'll see you next week